Arav is a senator, Thornton could be a Leaf, and Mike Hoffman is still homeless. The silly season of NHL free agency is upon us. It's Thursday, and this is the Hockey Debates Podcast, powered by SportsBettingDime.com. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bob Duff, as always, joined by my... uh, Eternal co-host, Kevin Allen, the Hall of Fame writer, and our Thursday regular, Sasha Farouk, the lead odds maker at sportsbettingdime.com. Uh, and it's time to talk free agency postscript, I guess, in a sense, even though there's still quite a few names out there looking for homes. Uh, quite a few have already found homes, and it's impacting the Stanley Cup odds. So I thought today, why don't we talk about uh, who's looking good and who's not looking so good after uh I almost said July 1st there because that's usually when we're talking free agency, but it's October. Anyway, uh, obviously the biggest name to move, Kevin, Alex Peter Angelo goes to Vegas. We touched on this some on uh, Tuesday, but I mean, as much as he helps him, he's certainly the best player who was available in this free agent class. What they had to move out and probably still have to move out some more to make room for his salary, has Vegas improved that much? I don't think so. You know, I, I, you know, I thought I was going to love that move, and I don't um, because, you know, to me, you know, you bring him in uh, and you don't have to move anyone out, then I like it a lot. You know, you've really improved. But Nate Schmidt was an important player on their defense. So how much have you added? I mean, would I prefer Peter Angelo over Nate Schmidt? Well, of course. But I, I, that's not the point. The point is, is that when you make a move like that, you take your existing uh, defense and then you're adding something to it. That's not what happened. And plus, they've got the nightmarish situation of having Mark Andre Fleury, the goalie who, um, you know, they insulted, uh, at least by his uh, agent's uh, uh, definition. And you know, he's still on the team. He's really unmovable as of right now, based on what we're we're told. And uh, you know, they're going to have to deal with that. So I don't know what happened. Like. Uh, uh, the Vegas Golden Knights entered this league and were uh, much more competitive than any expansion team ever had been before. They looked like the model of efficiency. Uh, and now they look like they're a little bit lost and not knowing, uh, um, you know, how to proceed. And uh, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously the big change was uh, Kelly McCrimmon went into the GM chair and uh, George McPhee went upstairs. Um, and uh, I just don't see this happening this way had George McPhee still been uh, at the uh, – have a hand on the wheel. Well, Sasha, the Vegas is one of the teams that made a big move in the, uh, the Stanley Cup tracker at sportsbettingdime.com. And, of course, this is the Hockey Debates podcast powered by sportsbettingdime.com. That's your leading source for odds, sports news, and game predictions. If you're looking to see who's going to be the favorite for the Stanley Cup, the Hart Trophy, or who's going to win a specific playoff series, check out all their information at sportsbettingdime.com. We're going to be talking about some of their odds in the show today, and we're also going to leave you a link at the end of the show so you can check them out for yourself. Now, Sasha, as I was saying, Vegas has gone from average plus 867 to average of plus 753 basically deadlocked with Colorado as the Stanley Cup favorite now. Is it simply the Peter Angelo move that makes that uh, happen in the betting odds? Uh, Yeah, basically. Um, Anytime there's sort of the biggest free agent name on the market landing anywhere, it's going to spur almost always um, some betting action. Um, And that's what you're seeing at this point in time. I personally think that is a drastic overreaction. you talked about the average odds going from eight, six, plus 867 to plus 753. Um, in terms of implied probability, 867 is 10.3%, 753 is 11.72%. So you're looking at a jump of 1.4%. Now that might not sound like a lot, but then you have to also factor in um, sort of what percentage gain that represents. And so you're basically looking at over 10%. Are they now, over 10% more likely to win the Stanley Cup by, as you said, adding Peter Angelo while subtracting Nate Schmidt and Paul Stastny. I certainly don't see it that way. And I think there's a valid argument, as you were saying, that the move might not even be a net positive. And on the flip side, you look at Colorado, their numbers basically didn't move at all. 
And yet they made a couple of moves that hockey people really like, you know, not sexy names maybe in Brandon Saad and Devin Tays, but certainly a lot of hockey people thought the Avalanche improved themselves significantly with those two moves. And, you know, already we're a pretty good team that got crippled by injuries on their Stanley Cup run last, well, last month, I guess. Are you kind of surprised that there really wasn't any movement with the Avalanche? I'm not because it's at this point in time, it's all sort of news and buzz driven. Um, and Devin Taze is just not going to move the needle for, for people who are paying attention to free agency right now. It's not going to spur them to go and lay a bet down if they hadn't already. Um, so no, I'm not terribly surprised. Um, Colorado was already at a pretty short price, um, which I think is very reasonable. They have a very good team and lots of cap space and, and basically bringing everyone back. Um, and so the sharp money that was on Colorado basically was already down, which is why you were seeing their odds so short to begin with. Um, so no, definitely not terribly surprised that Colorado stayed basically exactly where they were. Do you but, think a lot of but, this movement is caused by public money then rather than sharp money? Yeah, for the most part. Um, and as I was saying, you know, Colorado had lots of cap space, which everybody knew coming into this free agency period. And one of the reasons why they were um, on par with the Lightning, and even ahead of the Lightning at some sports books, is because sharp bettors were already factoring in they're going to improve their team in free agency. And so the people who recognized that um, had already put their money uh, sort of on, on Colorado to begin with. You're going to add something there, Kevin? I was. I was just going to say, though, that I would say um, uh, that the Colorado improved their team more than than Vegas did, uh, just with the players. And as you said, they're not sexy moves. But, you know, Devin Taves is uh, the kind of defenseman that every team is looking for with the way the game is now played at high speed. You know, he's a skater, he's a puck mover, he's a first pass guy. And he's going to a team that has a lot of terrific forwards up front. And, you know, he's going to fit very well with them. He's going to be a, uh, a uh, you know, a poor man's Makar. He'll be a Makar type player where, you know, he'll move the puck up the ice and and uh, make sure that he gets to the to the right player. So I like that. And I like the Brandon Saad move. Uh, uh, you know, we know uh, that it always helps to have, uh, I, I'm not sure that it helps as much as the teams think it does, but it does help a little to have a, a, someone who's been uh, there before. And Saad, of course, has won multiple championships with the Blackhawks and, um, you know, seems to uh, play even harder when he gets in the postseason. So I like both of those moves. And, you know, they didn't give anyone up uh, really per se that hurts their team like Vegas did and uh, getting Peter Angelo. So um, I like those moves even better for Colorado. A team you, you frequently like to talk about, Kevin, the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised to see their numbers improve. They were at plus 1,900. And now they're at plus 1767. They really didn't do anything in terms of adding during the last week. They got rid of uh, Matt Murray, and now basically you know, Tristan Jerry better be the real deal because they've handed him the net. So I'm is that just is that totally driven by star power? Because you know, it's the yeah. team of and Malkin? This might be better directed as, as fashion, but you know, I know from uh, you know the writers' experience that the the Penguins are a very popular team. Uh, nationally, like, uh, you know, they have a tremendous amount of re uh, readership there, you know, like the Dallas Cowboys in terms of football, if I could use a comparison, um, you know, a lot of people will read your stories if you write about the Penguins. And I wonder if it's just reflects that a lot of people, uh, you know, like to bet on the Pittsburgh Penguins just because, you know, for how many years have they just been a high octane offensive team and they sort of create, uh, you know, kind of a buzz about them. But uh, Sasha, is that, does that happen in betting that, just the popularity of the team that creates, you know, action. Absolutely. Um, those teams are called public teams and basically their odds end up being shorter than the sort of true strength of the team because members of the general public really, really like to bet on them. And so in hockey, you're definitely looking at teams like the Penguins, um, the Maple Leafs in football, the Cowboys are the number one offender. Um, in baseball, you'd be talking about the Yankees and the Dodgers um, and basketball anywhere LeBron is. Well, if, if the Penguins are indeed the Dallas Cowboys of the NHL, let's just hope that none of their star players suffer a horrific leg fracture next season because I don't want to look at that again on my TV. Yeah, a lot of people won't refuse to watch it. I have a friend that said, you know, I've only seen the Theismann 
videotape, I turn away every time it's still on, and I, he thinks Prescott's is the same way. He said he won't watch it. Yeah, I, the only reason I saw the Theismann one was because I was watching the game live, but the other two, yep. the, this one uh, with Dak Prescott and the horrible Alex Smith uh, leg fracture of a couple of years ago, kind of, I don't know if irony is the right term, but just kind of bizarre that the weekend that Alex Smith gets back on the football field is the weekend that Dak Prescott suffers a horrible similar leg injury. But, you know, we're not talking about football here. We're getting off topic here. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, as Sasha says, public teams. Is there a more public team in the NHL than the Toronto Maple Leafs? No. The Leafs did a lot of things in free agency, and uh, their numbers paralleled Pittsburgh identically. They were at plus 1,900. Now they're at plus 1,767. Is this just, uh, you know, rabid Leaf fans uh, getting too excited about their Stanley Cup chances now that they got some new faces to get excited about, Sasha? That it would be the only explanation I could offer. <laughs> um, sort of free agency period is bringing hockey back into the forefront for a certain period of time. Um, and so what I'm guessing happens is that um, members of the general public, because of free agency just generally happening, are going and looking at the Stanley Cup odds and seeing Toronto at plus 1900. So if I bet $100 on Toronto, it's going to return 1900 that's worth a shot, isn't it? Um, and, you know, you get a few people doing that, and it doesn't take too much to move the line from plus 1900 to plus 1780. And you get a, you know, obviously there's a lot of buzz always about the Leafs. I mean, Leaf fans will be arguing on Twitter about who should be the fourth line right winger on August 17th, you know, in a normal season when there isn't hockey in August. So, like, Leaf fans, like, I saw one tweet that pretty much summed it up, the, the coverage of TSN's uh, free agency. It was said, uh, you know, uh, Peter Angelo's going to Vegas. Yeah, but how does that affect the Leafs? You know, everything, everything that was moving, it was like, yeah. So let's talk about how that affects the Leafs. And that's kind of, if you watch the national show, sports shows in Canada, it's pretty much how the conversation goes. The conversation always goes back to, yeah, well, what about the Leafs? Because they know that's their audience. And uh you know, there are teams in every sport like that. Certainly the Yankees are that in baseball. And as Kevin said, the Cowboys are that in football. And uh, here we have another uh, buzzworthy story coming out of Toronto and rumors that the Leafs are uh, looking at Joe Thornton, 41-year-old Joe Thornton. Now, I'll preface this right off the bat. I love Joe Thornton. He's a tremendous player, probably even a better human being, just a great guy. I love talking to him, and Kevin can verify this. You know, he's a... He's not from the, uh, the hockey cliche school of get pucks deep. You ask Joe a question and Joe will tell you what's on his mind. And we always appreciate that as journalists because it's such a rare thing. But I'm just trying to look at this from a completely rational point of view and not let personal feelings get into it. I've used analytics. I've used tea leaves. I've used Venn diagrams. I've used the eye test. I've done what my grandmother used to do and held the sheet really up close to my eyes and squinted at it. And I just don't see how bringing Joe Thornton in, as much as I love the guy, gives Toronto a greater chance to win the Stanley Cup. And now, Kevin, you seem to disagree with me on that. Well, I, 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 yes and no. I mean, like, I don't think he can be a big help, but I, I don't think that, uh, you know, I think having Joe Thornton around your team is a good thing. Um, and just for all the reasons you mentioned and the fact that he can still pass the puck. And, you know, your point to me is a valid one. They don't really need offense, and he's not uh, uh, hes not fast. In fact, he's slow, um, So, and the game is fast. But, you know, the puck, as I like to say, moves fast when he passes it. And, you know, he's good to have him around. He's, you know, he's a valuable guy. If it doesn't cost you a lot of money, um, you know, you got to have extra guys around. you got to fill. You got to have 23 guys. I can't think of a better guy than Joe Thornton to have around. Um and, uh, you know, and maybe you can argue that he'll take up a, a young player spot, and that's probably a valid argument. But, uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I just think it, it could be helpful to have uh, kind of Thornton around, and um, I don't see what the big deal is, you know, provided that you don't have to overpay to get him. Um, you know, and he's, you know, he could help on the power play if there are injuries. He can slot up and down the – uh, the lines and do a lot of different things. So if they if they feel strongly about signing him, I I wouldn't think it was a horrible signing. I wouldn't think as all oh, like like wow this was a missing piece. Uh, I wouldn't see it that way. 
but I, I would see it as, you know, not a bad thing to do to have Joe Thornton around your uh, around your team. Well, and I'd agree with that, except that you already re-signed Jason Spezza, who's you know kind of a lower case Joe Thornton. I would say he's been a, a good, solid producer his whole career. Another guy who's a great guy. You know, everybody down the Leafs talked about how good it was to have him in the room, kind of a veteran voice. But now you've got two guys like that. Do you really need? And we, we discussed this with Adrian Dater on uh, Tuesday about you know the guys the Abs have brought in that have won cups and that does it. Does it really? And these guys haven't won cups. I mean, they both played in the finals, but they lost. And yeah. it, you know, like I don't know how. Like I, I the whole leaf free agency. Everybody loves it. I mean, I, I think Wayne Simmons is done. Another you know, the other player that I really like as a person and as a player. But you look at his numbers. Four years in a row, his goals have gone down significantly. Like, yeah. I just don't see. I, if I'm the Leafs, I would have put my money into a Craig Smith or a Jesper Foss, a you know a quicker player who can play in your bottom six, and if you need him, can play in your top six. And you know, is that old uh, hard to play against kind of thing they talk about? And I think those guys would have been uh, more suited to filling Toronto's needs. I'm in your corner. I don't know what the perfect move for Toronto was, but their power play was already sixth in the NHL. It's over 23%. Um, I would have loved to see Thornton go somewhere like Nashville, like Columbus, um, teams with bottom rank power plays, but are still um, definitely going to be in the playoff hunt. Um, I think I, I, I don't know. I don't know how much better Thornton can make Toronto's power play, given how good it was last year. And, you know, San Jose's was only averaging 17%. Well, I mean, he, I can't argue that he would have been a better fit in a better spot. But at a certain point, guys like Joe Thornton deserve the opportunity to go where they want to go. And, uh, you know, as long as they have room for him, as long as they want him. Um, so, you know, I mean, all, of, all your arguments are valid. Uh, mostly, I just think is that Bob does. Joe Thornton's a good guy. He's good to have around. I think he has value. Um even when he's no longer uh, the uh, lead dominant player that he once was. Um, so, you know, if they want to sign him, that's good. But, you know, your argument, the best argument you had for me is that they already got one. Do they, need to I, you know, I, 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 I got nothing to say to that because, you know, there's not, there's, I just don't see any circumstances where having two of them is, but, you know, I'm still okay with it. I, I don't know Joe Thornton personally. Um, do you have the sense that if he wasn't dressing every game, he would still be the positive locker room influence that he could be? Or is that something that would sit to him? Well, it's a fair point. I, I think he would be as long as, uh, you know, it wasn't one of those ones where he was going to set out 11 straight games or something like that. But mm -hmm. I, I think if you, you know, told him up front, hey, you're, you know, you're only likely to play 60 out of 82 or three quarters of the games or whatever. I bet he'd be okay with that. Now, another move the Leafs made, and this kind of emphasizes how the NHL draft is not an exact science. And in Alex Peter Angelo's draft year, I believe it was 2008, he went fourth overall. And Zach Bogosian went third overall. So the Leafs signed Zach Bogosian, had a great playoff with Tampa Bay after having a nightmare of a season in Buffalo. It kind of reminds me of the reverse with the Leafs. And they had Larry Murphy, got him from Pittsburgh, and he was just dreadful in Toronto. They literally booed him out of the city. He goes to Detroit. They put him next to Nick Lidstrom. He wins two Stanley Cups and looks like uh, a sensation. Now, Zach Bogosian goes to Tampa Bay and plays next to Victor Hedman, and similar things happen. Now, how much of Zach Bogosian's turnaround was Victor Hedman? And Who's going to be his Victor Hedman in Toronto, Kevin? <laughs> yeah, all of it. All of it was Victor Hedman. I, 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 this was the wrong move for Bogosian. Like, I don't know what his uh, his opportunities were in Tampa, if at all. But I would have said to them, you know, you have to have somebody. I'll play for your eight hundred thousand dollar minimum. What do you end up with Toronto? Not much, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I would have stayed there. I mean, at some point. Uh, you know, his career looked over in Buffalo and he goes to Tampa and he's a player again and he's important again. Uh, I would have said, whatever I got to do to stay here, I'll do it um, because, you know, he's probably got enough money, but I'm sure he still wants to play and still be effective. And it will not be easy for him in Toronto. Uh, it, you know that and I know that it's just it's going to be hard. You know, he's uh, 
uh, you know, as soon as he makes a mistake, they're going to be all over him. Where a Tampa, it life's a lot better. So if he had any opportunity to stay there, he should have. That's- Leaf fans like to have their whipping boy, and it seems it's more often than not a defenseman. And it was Murphy, you know. Yeah. This season, it was probably a toss up between Cody CC and uh, Tyson Berry. And Tyson Berry had some choice comments to make about. Toronto fans and the Toronto media and how vicious they can be when he signed with Edmonton because apparently he hasn't checked into how tough the Edmonton fans and media can be because he's not going to get a vacation there. But it is, a, as you say, it, it's like playing, you know, it's the NHL version of playing for the a team in New York, like the Yankees or the, the Jets or the, you know, whatever sport you choose, the Knicks, you're going to, every little move you make is going to get assessed and over-assessed and reassessed again. And the guys who have it rough are going to get it even rougher. So I think you're right, Kevin. I think this was the last place he wanted to sign a contract. Well, I, for sure. And, you know, it's fascinating to me, and I've always been uh, intrigued by, you know, some players relish the idea of going to Montreal or Toronto and to play on the big stage and face that pressure. And some players want nothing to do with that. You know, they just don't want to, you know, it's like, you know, some people go to the amusement park, they're on the roller coaster, and some like to take the, you know, the merry-go-round, uh, the real simple ride. And, you know, in Tampa, you know, they don't face that amount of pressure. The, you know, the new, the media is not as aggressive. Uh, life's just a lot easier when you're playing in Tampa than it is in Toronto or Montreal. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Sasha. I was just going to say, uh, if I'm Bogosian's agent, I really don't like this. I could understand if it was a multi-year contract for multi-million dollars, but one year for one million to put yourself in a situation where you're unlikely to succeed. I think someone's giving him some bad advice. Well, for sure. If he, if he could have stayed for the minimum, he should have done that. Yeah. Well, I can remember talking to Dave Andrichuk, whose experience in Toronto was outstanding. at back-to-back 50-goal seasons on teams that <laughs> went to the Final Four. And he told me when he went to the Devils, he said, you know how nice it is to be able to go out to dinner again with my wife and not have people constantly asking me about the power play or go to take my kids to the mall and just, you know, enjoy the day and not have people even know who I am. He said, they, and Kyle Wellwood told me when he played for the Leafs, he didn't have a television because he just didn't want to see any news about the team whatsoever. And he basically said, I would go home and I would read. I wouldn't even go out for dinner. He said, just, some, as you say, some guys thrive in that environment and some guys it eats them up. Yeah, yeah. You got to factor all those uh, things in, and especially at Bogosian, this stage of his career, I, you know, and, you know, he just won a cup. Like, I would have thought the jubilation would have been flowing over him, and he would have just got down on his knees uh, with uh, Breeze Bois and said, I'm your $800,000 defenseman. Uh, you know, let, let me do it here because he did. You know, he, you know, he found a nice role there, and they, you know, and I, you, you know what that conversation was like with Breezeball when they got him. Just do what you do, and we'll be happy with you. Don't try to do any more, and don't get in the way of Victor doing what he does. And if you do that, we're going to love you. And he did that, and they loved him uh, because of that. And, you know, they won't have that conversation in Toronto. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll expect him to be more like uh, he was when he started in his career or what people thought he was going to do. And, uh, you know, they're not going to be looking at him to um, just be playing uh, the way he did in Tampa. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think if you do that for another year, then you essentially trick at least one NHL general manager into thinking, oh, he could do that for us. You get yeah. to Victor Edmund, and then you get a two-year deal for maybe $3 million. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> no, not everybody was viewed as a winner from the first week of free agency. And uh, Sasha, you're out in Vancouver where apparently uh, Jim Benning's the dumbest man on the face of the earth, according to Canucks fans on social media. It, it just seemed like they couldn't get anybody to convince anybody to stay or didn't want anybody to stay. It was hard to say. But every free agent they had went somewhere else. And there was actually a fire betting trend on Twitter. And you know, this is a guy whose team was within a win of going to the final four. And it just, I always said Twitter is where every coach and every GM gets fired every day. Yeah. Um, I'm in the camp of, I don't think this was a very good period for the Canucks. It's not necessarily 
letting everyone go, but I do not understand bringing in Braden Holtby when you're letting go of your starting goalie. Um, Thatcher Demko played incredibly well for three games against the Vegas Golden Knights. His performance up to that point had been, you know, sort of mediocre at best for an NHL starting goalie. If you are wanting to make a deep run in the playoffs again, I don't know which of these goalies you are supremely confident in taking you there. Um, yes, Demko could all of a sudden become a bona fide number one goalie who's capable of playing 55, 60 games and then taking you on another deep run in the playoffs. Um, but equally, and I would say more likely, he's going to go back to the player that you had seen this regular season and last regular season, which is okay, but not as good as Jacob Markstrom. And if you're banking on it being Colby, then you are banking on him turning back the clock. Kevin, is this a case? Uh, I mean, we talked about Vancouver a lot this year and we saw them as a team that was moving toward being a contender, but wasn't there yet. And it's almost like they decided at the trade deadline, Hey, we're, we're further ahead than we thought we were going to be. We've got a shot this year. So let's bring some guys in and see if we can make a run at this. And then just deciding, you know, when it didn't work out, they didn't get there. Okay. We're not really that team yet. Let's just let those guys go and, you know, get back on our uh, building program. Is that an element here at all? Yeah. Well, I think that's what happened. Um, but to me, the the, the, the the stressful thing, if you're a fan, is, is you watch Toffoli, you know, leave, not be able to resign there, say, in Vancouver, and then end up getting what I thought was a remarkably weak contract given his status as a, as a free agent. I, I thought he would get a lot more. And um, I thought, uh, you know, they could have uh, kept him in, in Vancouver if they wanted. And I, I didn't think that uh, uh, Markstrom's contract was outrageous. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I, I thought that I, I would have been, you know, keeping Markstrom would have been a priority if I was the Canucks. Because um, you know, he was the reason why they, they, you know, they were in the position they were. Um, and, you know, no matter how good your uh, team is, you know, you got to have that stable goaltending and he provided that. And if they had him, now they had an incredible asset. Like there'd be, there'd be a no greater time to trade Thatcher Demko than right now. Like they could have got a King's ransom for him. Yeah. Uh, I know there's at least two general managers that said, if they keep Marshall, I'm going to make a big bid for Thatcher Demko. So, um, because, uh, and you know we don't we don't know whether Thatcher Demko is going to be the real deal or not. So HockeyReference.com um, keeps track of a stat called goals saved above average, um, and so it basically factors in how many shots you faced and shot quality is, is uh, the sort of biggest difference from just goals against average. Um, and Braden Holby last year was minus sixteen goals saved above average. It was the second worst among goalies who had played at least ten games. Jacob Markstrom was just outside the top 10 at plus 11.4. So you have significantly downgraded. Who was number one on that list? Tuka. Tuka Rask. Yeah. And then yeah. Heller. That's a good segue for us, thing because I was just going to mention the Boston Bruins. They're a team that really didn't do much of anything. They lost Tory Krug, which was expected, but they really didn't make any significant moves on free agent week one of free agency. And, uh, their odds have gone from plus 1167 to plus 1233. The Bruins look to me like a team that is kind of teetering. Like they're probably still good enough to be in the playoffs and maybe win a round or two, but I don't know that they're contenders anymore, and I don't know that they're that far away from slipping out of a playoff position. Where do you see them, Kevin? Well, I, I, you know, I think that's a valid assessment of them. Um, I think they're still good, but, you know, they have, like – I don't understand what their thinking is. I mean, apparently they've decided that Jake DeBrusque and Tuka Rask, now Jake DeBrusque, they can still resign them, but we're hearing they, they, they may not, may just ship them out. Um, and so, and, and uh, you know, Tory Krug, like, I, I don't know what that's about. You know, everybody said, well, they're, they're you know, they're going to get bigger defensively. Well, they didn't. Um, you know, if they were going to make a run at Peter Angelo, it didn't work out. Um, they haven't re-signed Zidane Chara, so 
I guess they'll do that, but you know, no one seems to kind of know what their game plan is there. And more importantly, like uh, you know, we keep hearing rumblings that this is it for Tuukka Rask. That you know, he'll need to be traded now, or you know, he's going to retire. And uh, you know, now it, like it, the read on it, it feels like he may have been insulted by the team's reaction, his decision, and you know, they're, they're kind of in a messy situation. And, that's not what we expect from the Bruins, who seem to be pretty buttoned up, um, you know, in the way they approach things. So I don't know what the game plan is there. You know, there's a there's a bunch of people still out there that could help them, including Hoffman, um, who, you know, I'm surprised is still there. He's uh, uh, like I thought someone I, I read uh, summed it up when he basically said, you know, if you're looking for consistent scoring, um, you know, Hoffman is your guy. Like, you know, every he's there. He's there with his numbers, you know, every year. You know, he's got those numbers. He puts it in. The problem you have with him is when you start looking at your team, the guy he's going to replace to get those numbers, you look at him and say, yeah, but that guy's a better hockey player. Like, there are a lot of better hockey players who just don't get the numbers that Hoffman gets. So it really comes down to what your needs are. And if you're a team like Dallas that's desperate for scoring or Nashville that's desperate for scoring – uh, you know, Hoffman looks pretty good. And then I guess with other teams, they're looking at him and saying, well, the guy I got there doesn't score like him, but, you know, he's just a better all-around player. So, um, but anyway, with, with getting back to Boston, you know, I, I agree with you. They're still a contender, but I, I it, it seems like they're in a confused state right now about what their uh, mission is. Now, I'll tell you a funny, Mike, I don't know if it's funny, but, a Mike Hoffman story I was told by an NHL executive of one of his former teams. I won't mention which one, but they said the issue with Mike Hoffman is that he just doesn't really seem to have a real high hockey IQ. They'll explain to him what they want him to do in situations, and they think he gets it. And then when they run the drill, it's like the way the executive explained it to me is like, Mike has puck, Mike must shoot. <laughs> no matter what they tell him and no matter how agreeable he seems to be as soon as they run the drill he gets the puck and he shoots yeah well put him on the canadians just please put him on the canadians yeah i mean there's some you know you know it's amazing too how the the uh uh the defensemen got their money the forwards didn't in this uh uh, you know like all the top scorers took less than i think they thought with the exception of uh Dad enough, um, you know, who got a better contract than to Foley and, you know, and got, got three years out of it, but he, you know, he had to go to the worst team in the, in the league or second worst team in the league. So, um, you know, defense, but all did pretty well, you know, Craig Smith left, left Nashville to go to Boston and he took less money than he was making before. And, you know, he's a pretty consistent 20 goal scorer. Uh, this was, uh, teams were more interested in getting defensemen than they were, uh, forwards, that's for sure. Well, maybe by next week when we uh, reconvene, some of these guys like Mike Hoffman will have found jobs and we can talk about how that's impacting their teams. But right now we're out of time. As usual, the time goes faster than the stuff to talk about. I'm Bob Duff. He's Kevin Allen. And that's Sasha Peruk. We're the Hockey Debates podcast team powered by sportsbettingdive.com. And we will be back with you again to talk more hockey next week. Have a great day, everybody.